Welcome to the May meeting of the St. Augustine Archaeological Association. Uh, like all of our talks, uh, we welcome Estrebelay members as well as people who uh, may be coming or hearing us for the first time. If you are interested in getting more information about our organization, you can always Google SAAA, look through the uh, different organizations that have that acronym, and we're there, one of the third or fourth down. And uh, feel free to get in contact with us. We also have a a presence on Facebook that you can access and uh, and uh, feel free to contact us or, or find out what we're up to. Uh, as you know, things have changed a lot uh, since our last uh, time we've met as a, as a group uh, back in March. We've had to, because of you know what, we've had to cancel our March meeting, our late March activities and our uh, early April meeting. Uh, and we thought we were going to have to cancel this meeting as well, which is particularly unfortunate because it's one of our favorites. It's a traditional uh, meeting that we have at the, uh, the, uh, in, the, in May, usually. And it's where we ask several of our, our most active local archaeologists to uh, present uh, the, their year in review and also plans for the upcoming period. And it's a great way to get caught up with with what's going on here in, around St. Augustine in the Northeast Florida. And it's one of the most popular programs with, uh, with our members. And we thought we were not gonna be able to do it this year until uh, Sarah Miller and Chuck Mead stepped up and volunteered to record their uh, talks, and, uh, the, which they are doing, and you'll hear them shortly. Um, before that, I just wanted to do a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to, mentioned that uh, uh, we don't know exactly what our plans are gonna be in the fall as an organization. Uh, one thing we can guarantee is that we'll be active, that it'll appear one way or the other, either as a virtual or an actual presence. And we'll be getting that word out as far as our meetings and such like go. We, you may have heard the good news or interesting news coming out of Mound Key in Southwest Florida with uh, Bill Mockbot and the University of Georgia Field Schools. Uh, learning more, uh, ver getting more verification on the uh, early mission and fort, uh, Spanish fort that was located there uh, in 1566. And we'll, uh, certainly that would be one of the items we'd like to be able to update people uh, on as we get into the, uh, the fall schedule. Uh, the two speakers today are Sarah Miller, who is the regional director for the Northeast and East Florida centers of the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Uh, we know that as FPAN, and they're the strong educational and advocacy arm uh, of archaeology in the state. And uh, Sarah has been here for uh, about a dozen years and has been very involved locally and, uh, and uh, around the state and actually nationally with the uh, Society for Historical Archaeology and a number of other organizations uh, and uh, has, has been uh, a, a key person in, in uh, connecting the threat of uh, climate change with the risk to particularly our coastal uh, cultural resources, uh, both in Florida and, and setting up programs that have been duplicated around the country in different spots. And we're, we're happy to have her here. Uh, the other speaker today is uh, Chuck Mead, who is the director of St. Augustine Lighthouse's Lighthouse Archaeology Maritime Program, also known as LAMP. Uh, and uh, he leads, a, he directs a group of uh, very talented archaeologists, conservationists, and historians who are uh, uh, very uh, funded as, as in a very difficult funding time, funded by the uh, uh, St. Augustine Lighthouse and its programs, and it really acts as the research arm of the Lighthouse uh, Maritime uh, Museum and, and Lighthouse, and, and uh, he uh, obviously is involved in uh, a lot of underwater archaeology and uh, various and sundry projects from uh, 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 conservation of the materials found to uh, historical research and uh, runs a very interesting field school, so very popular and he'll be talking about uh, those items uh, today. Uh, and before I turn it over, I'd like to say just one more thing. I'd like to recommend 
uh, a couple of sources for the video, for the downtime. And we're all uh, kind of wishing we were out maybe in the field or wishing that we were hearing more about archaeology. We get a little withdrawal sometimes from, from uh, uh, needing to, we need to scratch that archaeology itch. And I think I'd like to recommend three of my favorites. Uh, they're all somewhat available on YouTube and uh, would be a good place to start. Uh, the, uh, the first one is also available on Amazon Prime, and that's uh, an old favorite, uh, the British program Time Team. Uh, and over about a 20 year period on television in England, they uh, did over 270 odd programs uh, of uh, individual digs and excavations that range from prehistoric up to uh, the Second World War uh, period archeology. span and they do it with humor and a lot of energy and, and excitement. And you get a real sense of the ups and downs of a dig. And uh, particularly a dig that, that's time related, uh, salvage archeology span that you don't have the luxury of, of taking a lot of time to do. And, uh, but uh, uh, it's the reality of a lot of digs that happen. And uh, it, it sure rings a bell uh, with me when, when I see it. Um, the uh, other two are both classical archaeologists who uh, work, uh, uh, one is Mary Beard, uh, who's a wonderfully droll uh, uh, scholar uh, who is uh, focused mainly on Roman and, but also Greek uh, everyday life. And her focus is, uh, is, is that. And, and uh, uh, three particular uh, videos, a series called Meet the Romans, which I think is delightful. And it really gives you a good idea, uh, as much as we can get, of what it's like to be a, uh, uh, a Roman through their class school history. And the other is Darius Aria, uh, great name. Uh, his uh, last name is spelled A-R-Y-A. And I believe he's a Florida native, uh, but he's been for many years, has lived in Rome. And he's the director of the American Institute for Roman Culture. Uh, and uh, he's performed a number of, uh, supervised a number of field schools in very interesting places like the Roman Forum, the Appian Way, and other spots around the city. And has done, he's a media guy, he's done a lot of programs. Uh, you may have seen him on TV. And he uh, has uh, uh, videos of various sundry links on YouTube on a wide range of aspects of Roman culture, ancient Roman culture. And during this you know what period here, he's been uh, uh, doing two live webinars every week that can be accessed uh, by us and by anyone around the world. Uh, and uh, one is on Sundays for adults and one is on Wednesdays for teenagers. And he's been talking about interesting, uh, interesting activities and interesting parts of aspects of Roman culture. So I'd, I'd recommend any of those as a way to while away a, a little bit of time. And I just, before I turn it over, I'd like to just say that, uh, you know, St. Augustine's archaeology program and, and all the various activities around town are, are, are going to be continuing. And we don't know exactly the form they'll take come fall. But, uh, you know, watch out and look for us. It takes more than a worldwide pandemic to, uh, to keep down uh, archaeology here. And I uh, want you all to stay safe and listen, listen to our speakers. Thanks. Hi, guys. Sarah Miller from the Florida Public Archaeology Network coming to you from my backyard and maybe into your living room. So things done a bit differently this year, but this is one of my favorite talks of the year to give. SAAA is such an important organization to me, and I'm really glad you guys were on board for trying a virtual format. Thanks to Nick and also to Chuck coming up in just a minute. Because everything's a little topsy-turvy this year, I thought I'd try something new for our update, letting you know what's been going on at FPAN the last year. And instead of just going through the talk like I regularly do, take some questions from the audience. Yes, you over there. Oh, hey Sarah, it's Robbie Boggs, office manager at FPAN, the Flagler College campus. I was just wondering, did FPAN do any work in historic cemeteries last year? 
Excellent question, Robbie. Yes, we were very busy in historic cemeteries this year. This is us in the summer. We're having not just our cemetery resource protection training workshop, but our full on conference. So this is the fourth iteration of that conference and you can see the fun shirts designed by Mallory Fenn. Um, we were in Punta Gorda. We were welcomed by the mayor. We had a slate of great presentations the first day and the second day we went out into the cemeteries, did some documenting and recording. Also got to do some uh, 3D scanning and some ground penetrating radar. So thanks to all the FPAN members who joined in and made that a successful program thanks to about the hundred registrants that we had that came out to make cemetery safer and here we are celebrating giving out the golden d2 award to the hard-working stewards in Sanford and know that they've made good use of that in cleaning headstones our last cemetery resource protection training workshop of the year was here in st. John's County and thanks to Ms. Mercedes Harold who helped us organize that she's not photoed here because she's walking the grounds with some of those uh, taking the workshop. But uh, we were at San Sebastian, walked back a little bit into Pinehurst, did some recording, and it was really special to have descendants of those who are buried taking part in that workshop. So we hope to continue with more this year. This is a big year for African American cemeteries. I don't know if you've been aware of what's going on on the west side of Florida with Zion Cemetery and um, up in Jacksonville, also some forgotten African American cemeteries that uh, are being refound during construction, having to be moved. Uh, Janet Cruz filed a bill for um, first for some funds to help cemeteries, but then it morphed into more supporting a task force to help address this major issue of thousands of cemeteries that are being neglected and forgotten. The bill got through the Senate got to the floor and then died somewhere uh, in the way to the house. So we hope that it gets revitalized next year. Here are some of the FPAN and crypt stewards that went out to support the bill and just uh, give some information on why these resources are just so significant and so rare. Hot off the presses, this is posted to the FPAN website. It's a new set of lessons for high school teachers um, to be taught in a Florida or world history course on gravestone research and volunteer based education grave. So give it a look. And if you know a teacher forward that along to them. All right, next question. Yes, you. Hey, Sarah, Emma Dietrich, public archaeology coordinator for the East Central region. I hear that there is a Sanford office. Can you tell us a little bit about what they've been up to? Excellent question, Emma. Yes, we do have an office in Sanford. Here it is. You're looking at it. Um, we have uh, George here defending his internship to UCF professor Dr. Scott French. And you can see a little of what that space looks like. We have some 3D lab for printing, some uh, hot topics of what to do on that back blackboard, and um, some other resources out and about on the table. Emma Dietrich is our public archaeology coordinator for the East Central region. She does a great job down there. Uh, here she has lured Emily Jane down to Rollins campus to have a program with Dr. Gilmore on Florida's past and does a lot of good work with the other academic institutions down in the East Central region. She's also really well known for her Florida Tales through Ales program, uh, generally at WAPOPs. Uh, they make a small batch brew to accompany a lecture. So they draw on themes inspired from the historical topic, whether it's um, prehistoric Floridians and making uh, ingredients from the Yupon Holly and the black drink. Um, there's one that was on some of the mounds that's in central Florida and they use some kind of snail <laughs> juice that was in there or citrus is another good topic kitchen, um, the turpentine industry and maritime. So it's just been a nice uh, blending of what we love about doing our pub crawls up here. Uh, and then also a SAAA lecture. Imagine those two things blended together. And that's one of the Florida tales through ales. Emma is also a diver. So you can see her here at the DEMA conference here. She's giving out information along with other FPAN divers on some of the wrecks that Sport divers can go visit how to visit a wreck ethically and leave only bubbles and touch no artifacts and also show uh, how important the underwater resources are in Florida in addition to those that are terrestrial and on the ground. Okay, next question. Hi, Sarah. Patty Myers, project manager for HMS Florida. Didn't FPAN receive a major grant from the state last year? 
I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about it and what you guys have been up to lately. Excellent question, Patty. Yes, we did get a big special category grant from the Florida um, Division of Historical Resources, Department of State, and we have been hard at work. One of the things that the grant allowed us to do was hire two full-time staff members for the Heritage Monitoring Scout program, Patty Myers, who's um, manager of HMS, and also Cassie Kemp, who's the database manager for HMS. The grant kicked off in July. Um, it really changed our scout strategy. I think before you've seen some big numbers of scouts uh, active and the sites they visited, the grant really caused us to stop with a opportunistic monitoring model and go to a um, more thought out suite of 500 sites we're going to go to and we have to get permits for those on state land so they have been very busy getting lots of permits lined up and we had hoped to announce uh, over the summer some more scouting opportunities those may have to wait till the fall but i'm really excited people can come out and help us monitor sites and also help us do some 3d scanning and thanks to those who have been active during this uh, time as we're working out the new normal for HMS. We've been very busy working out the database, uh, getting it refined in Arches so you can um, search things, see what region you're in, which county you're in, and scouts are able to upload their own reports and photos and also see photos that other scouts have submitted for that same site. So we're continuing on those updates and getting an uh, app um, up and ready, uh, hopefully for launch this fall. Um, so our monitoring has looked a little different. I had never monitored sites using airboats, but thanks to Brent and Graham from the St. John's River Management District, we, Water Management District, here we are loaded up on airboats and going out to check out some of the sites in Volusia and Seminole County. And that has been really fun and we're excited to bring the public out with us when appropriate uh, to monitor some of the sites out there. All right, next question. Hey Sarah, it's Cassie Kemp, the HMS database manager for HMS Florida, and I had a question for you. What did FPAN do for Florida Archaeology Month this year? Excellent question, Cassie. Yes, um, Florida Archaeology Month is every March, as we know, and FPAN and SAAA, we had a lot planned for that month. Uh, we really liked the poster design and highlighting African American cemeteries across the state, both on the front and on the back. So a lot of our programming was centered um, around that topic for the month. We did get to the county proclamation. So thanks to Mercedes Herald for setting that up. And it was wonderful to hear those elected officials talk about uh, historic cemeteries, how important they are in the county and have a public meeting just to show that there's a lot of interest and dedication into preserving these places. Uh, this was the second week what our plans were. Uh, we were out at Tomoka Basin doing some monitoring that Monday. I had the Tales Through Ales talk. I was talking about the Irish and Colonial Florida down in Sanford at one of the Tales Through Ales. Uh, and Emily Jane had some workshops for 3D archaeology, a talk at the library, and also a workshop on beads. But that Monday we were told to stop scheduling anything new. And by that end of the week, we were told to stop all activities. So it's really tough because Florida Archaeology Month is the thing we gear up for all year, get out there and really tap into new audiences that maybe have not heard about how significant Florida archaeology is. We hope to redouble those efforts next year, whatever the theme is, maybe returning to this theme or Emily Jane had a good idea for October since we have International Archaeology Day then, and a lot of other states have their Archaeology Month then, maybe do some catch up. So we'll see what the future holds. All right, next question. Hey, Sarah, William Lee's here, Executive Director of the Florida Public Archaeology Network. Last year, as your member, FPAN brought Tom and Joe over from SCAPE for the uh, last uh, SAAA lecture. I was wondering, if FPAN had worked with any other international groups in this past year. I will look forward to your answer. Thank you. Dr. Lees, wonderful to hear from you all the way from Pensacola. And yes, we did continue uh, our international collaborations. You are right, Tom and Joe gave the last talk at SAAA last year in May. They were here for the Keeping History Above Water program. So thanks to SAAA for welcoming them in the Flagler Room. 
And this year, uh, we were contacted by the Office of American States if we could help host some from the Caribbean Heritage Network that wanted to know more about heritage interpretation. Um, a lot of the tourism for the beaches is shifting into the millennials, the others who are much more interested in the heritage tourism opportunities. So it was a good time to meet them, some of our Caribbean colleagues, but also pair them up with those who do interpretation so well here in St. Augustine in Northeast Florida. So here we are, uh, first place we went after our morning of workshops was over to the St. Augustine Lighthouse. So thanks to Brenda Swan and to the Lighthouse for hosting us there. We thought um, what a great way to talk about maritime history and uh, research and the work that LAMP does uh, through the exhibits and very interactive. So I thought what a great place to start having that conversation for how to um, update and hold in the interpretive themes that are so strong here that we would share with our uh, Caribbean neighbors. We were hosted at the Castillo for an uh, intensive walk around and looking at the many different interpretive devices they do there. And thanks to the staff and volunteers who helped show us around. The second day, we went all the way up to Kingsley Plantation. And this was Mike Tommen's idea that, you know, we really need to show them plantation interpretation and done really well. And it is probably the highlight of my year to be with that group and discuss um, those who are descendants of the slave trade, those who uh, work in these areas where plantation archeology span is not interpreted or plantations are interpreted very differently, still with hoop skirts and wide brim hats. So getting away from those that owned and operated the plantations to those who lived um, in the slave cabins and worked in the fields and it was a very um, powerful day spent so thanks to Emily and to Cece who took their time to have a very long walk around the grounds and have very meaningful discussions about the, the heart of why um, these stories are so difficult to tell and why they need to be told. So I think this day had a lot of great impact for those visiting from the Caribbean. Um, this is us uh, still walking around some of the inside exhibits at the lighthouse on the left. And then we ended our time together at Fort Mose, walked around the grounds at Fort Mose and had our final debrief in the meeting room there. So thanks to the staff for opening up for that today. Uh, looks like we have time for one final question. Yes. Hey, Sarah, it's Emily Jane from FPAN Northeast. I was just wondering what kind of outreach activities FPAN has been doing during the pandemic. Thanks. Emily Jane, what a great question. Um, yes, we had to do a big pivot with um, COVID and move a lot of our public outreach programs online. And I think you and others at FPEN have done a really great job at translating the very different ways people are interested about archaeology. And what I love, you guys put together these tea and trowel episodes. I think you're up to seven or eight by now, both you and Emma. And it's a nice way to share what we know about Florida archaeology, but also what the other archaeologists really want to share with the public about their jobs, what they find out, and um, the significance of the very different ways between academic to CRM to counting and city to research, the different ways archaeology is done. So if you haven't, check out some of the Tea and Trowels episodes. You can find them on our Facebook pages or also on our YouTube Northeast channel, likely where you are viewing this video today. And Emma's also matched um, Emily Jane episode for episode. Uh, their first episode was even together, I think. So she has interviewed Dr. John Worth and also a lot of the NOAA staff. Um, so getting out to other archeologists that I haven't even met yet. So it's been a wonderful way to catch up with them and enjoy uh, a little lunch break, tea break with different archeologists. Emily Jane also did a program in um, New Smyrna Beach with the museum for a matinee program. So it's very hard for public archaeologists to do these kind of programs because they're very one-sided. We don't know when you're laughing or when you're really engaged with the topic. But I think, uh, again, we've got to do what we can to adjust to the times and really proud of staff for doing that. There are so many other um, great things that other FPAN staff and other regions are doing. 
uh, Rachel Kangas, who also used to work at the East Central office and is now in the Southwest office doing some really great uh, FPAN Live shows along with Mallory Fenn. And they also had this cats before the internet and I almost just registered five times just because it looks so fun. Um, also Mike Tallman, who's been doing some tours. There's another one of um, Mallory, uh, Mallory Fenn's live Facebook shows. And I did get to work with my friend um, Gwen Henderson and we put out a reading she did on Kentucky archeology, span but it got to about 6,000 people. So I think people in different areas are really interested and really hungry for this information. And if you know of any teachers, we do know of a resource, the Society of American Archaeology has put together a big crowdsourced list of all the different archaeology education materials available and tools for teachers, but also now us um, homeschool teachers, all of us at home with our kids, and also through the summer, it looks like the isolation will continue. Well, thanks everybody. It's been a joy to talk to you today. I can't wait till we are in the Flagler room together again, hopefully in the fall. We have these stickers made. We meant to surprise them with you tonight. So surprise, we have stickers, but extra surprise. It may take till the fall till we can distribute them. But this is a partnership with the City Archaeology designed by Andrea uh, with um, uh, input by Catherine Sims. Nigel Rudolph did the graphics from FPAN Central and other staff uh, we just love these stickers and can't wait to get them in your hands next time we're together. Stay safe, everybody. And next will be Chuck Mead giving you an update from the Lighthouse Archaeology Maritime Program. Hello, everybody, NSAAA. Uh, this will be an interesting experiment in technology in this uh, time of coronavirus, but I'm uh, glad. Sarah Miller has uh, been helping me out try to be able to uh, beam this directly into the internet so everyone can watch it. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting time and it's uh, always an interesting time at LAMP and with archaeology in St. Augustine. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started with uh, the slideshow I prepared uh, to talk about what's been going on at LAMP uh, lately. So let's see if this works. Okay, it looks like uh, we are good to go. Um, as you all know, every uh, year at this time, early May or so, uh, uh, FPAN and LAMP and usually the county uh, provides an update to what's been going on. There's so much going on in St. Augustine archeology span that it's always really interesting to see what everyone else has been up to. And so as usual, this has been a busy year uh, for LAMP, but it's also been a unique year, year uh, because we've lost uh, some of our uh, uh, good archeologists who have moved on. So we said goodbye to Allison Ropp this year. Allison was, uh, brought so much to LAMP and so much to archeology span in St. Augustine and public archeology span to St. Augustine. Uh, and she had been here for a couple years. So uh, we really miss her. And she has gone back to her home state of North Carolina and is uh, working with East Carolina University. So she will do great things there. And then of course, there was Brendan Burke. Uh, he's, a, he's a tough blow uh, to lose because he was stupendous at everything. Such a great scholar, uh, such a good lecturer, uh, such a great uh, researcher uh, and, a, and a good archeologist. So we will really miss Brendan. Uh, uh, people always uh, will tell me like, you know, both Brendan and Allison are irreplaceable. How are you going to replace them? Uh, and, and yet we found that we did a pretty good job with a CPR dummy in a wetsuit and sunglasses. So it's really like nothing's changed. So all that is going well. But in all seriousness, uh, we have new team members as well. Uh, and so we've gotten in some uh, young blood uh, here at LAMP. And uh, Austin Burkhardt is our new dive safety officer and an archaeologist, and he's been fantastic uh, keeping us safe and uh, running a lot of uh, survey equipment and uh, doing all kinds of great things. And then we have Nick Budsberg, who's wrapping up his PhD at Texas A&M University, and Nick uh, has been uh, fantastic as well. Uh, so we have a strong team, and we are still uh, uh, moving forward even in these uh, crazy times. <clears throat> I included this slide 
uh, because I think it's interesting. Uh, this was uh, taken in May of 2019. And uh, uh, our conservation team here, uh, Star and Dorothy and Andrew, are sorting coal that we collected from the steamship wreck back in 2009. So 10 years later, uh, we have desalinated uh, all of this coal in our laboratory and we are, uh, we've now sent it out uh, to be analyzed. So that's just kind of a reminder of how long archaeology uh, can take. You know, this is a process in not just in the field, but in the laboratory that can uh, take a lot of uh, 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 vigilance to uh, carry. Um, this picture was not taken in St. Augustine. Uh, you can tell because you can actually see some underwater. Uh, this is a, a picture taken on an anchor that was discovered that is believed to be associated with one of Cortez's ships. Uh, and the group that has been searching for these ships, uh, at University of Miami and some other research organizations, uh, including uh, the government of Mexico, uh, came to us and to uh, use the spring break wreck that uh, so many of you are, uh, have heard about uh, when this came ashore back in 2018 and is now at the GTM Research Reserve. Uh, but they thought that the spring break wreck uh, as kind of an empty piece of hull uh, with a very scant uh, iron remains uh, might give a similar magnetic signal uh, to what one of these Cortez ships uh, look like magnetically. And so they're trying to find them using a magnetometer. And so we kind of simulated a marine magnetometer survey, as you can see here, uh, with uh, Chris Harrell, a colleague uh, visiting us on the left, and then Nick uh, Budsberg from LAMP. Uh, and uh, so using some of the resources we have right here in St. Augustine to help other archaeologists uh, make big discoveries uh, elsewhere, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, in uh, May also, uh, we assisted Flagler College, uh, Dr. Lori Lee with her field school by just uh, using some good lamp logistical, uh, uh, marine logistics experience to get a lot of their equipment by water uh, to their site. And it, it turns out we will be doing some research uh, of our own at Fort Mose uh, in the future, uh, funded by our grant. So that is exciting. Uh, in June, we uh, had, this was kind of a fun little mini project, but we had a documentary film crew wanted to use us uh, as archeological experts uh, for an episode uh, for a series called Shipwreck Secrets. In this episode, the Cotopaxi, which uh, was famous for being lost in the Bermuda Triangle, uh, we, uh, we accompanied the divers and uh, I went out, got me on film some, and I, we actually weren't uh, uh, with the dive team, but we did contribute a, a pretty important thing. Uh, see that uh, tape measure there? That's one of our tape measures. And other divers had never thought to bring a tape measure with them. And uh, with uh, some uh, coordinating uh, together, uh, planning their dives, they took some key measurements on the shipwreck that actually helped identify uh, the shipwreck as the Cotopaxi. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, I got to play with an ROV, which is kind of like an underwater drone. Interesting experience, and I'm not a very good water drone operator, by the way. And we got to see dolphins. Uh, so it was pretty 35 miles off St. Augustine. Uh, this is a picture of the Cotopaxi. Uh, again, it wrecked off St. Augustine in 1925. And it became famous because of Steven Spielberg, who used it in his movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, and so this was a fun little project. It was fun to be involved and to help uh, uh, get a good confirmation of the identity of this shipwreck. And uh, they also uh, filmed us in the laboratory. You can see Brendan Burke here. And they uh, uh, had, uh, uh, we worked so well with them that they came back and did a few other episodes with us uh, as well. And then uh, these uh, episodes have been airing on this show, Shipwreck Secrets, uh, which has been a lot of fun and a lot of great experience uh, for uh, St. Augustine archaeology. Uh, well, the first regular day of our field season came a little bit later uh, in, in June. And of course, we were gearing up for our field school students uh, arriving as they do every summer in late June. And uh, our field season started with a discovery, actually. We discovered another uh, shipwreck. Uh, it turned out to be a shrimp boat wreck, and it was kind of an accidental discovery. Uh, our new research on the previous slide uh, right there, uh, the Empire Defender, uh, is equipped with a side scan sonar that's built into the boat. And you can see what we just happened to run over as we were going out to one of our known sites. 
Uh, and so we did some dives on this and we're trying to maybe figure out uh, uh, the identity of this uh, uh, shipwreck. Uh, you know, obviously it's a more modern wreck, but uh, the, the, uh, the shrimping heritage, shrimping and shrimping here in St. Augustine is so important to our maritime history that this could be an interesting uh, shipwreck. So it'll, it'll, be, um, it'll be neat to see if we can figure out uh, uh, the identity of this uh, wreck. Uh, our field school started uh, late June and ran through July. Uh, we had a lot of students this year, as well as uh, visiting supervisors who were uh, graduate students from other universities like East Carolina, uh, University of West Florida, Texas A&M, and Florida State University. Uh, so we had a great uh, field school. We focused our uh, diving work on the anniversary wreck, uh, which is an offshore shipwreck, uh, dates to sometime 1765 and before 800. Um, uh, with our new research vessel, the Empire Defender, uh, we stage diving operations, and I actually have a, a, a short piece of video. Uh, so again, you can see what's going on underwater in St. Augustine. That means it's a good visibility day. So this is pretty rare, and in fact, I think we only had one or two days where we could actually see, uh, like you can see here, uh, and then the rest of the dive season, it was black. But so for a uh, for a brief period, we got to see what we were doing, which is helpful when we're setting up our grids and beginning to dredge. And we got to see some uh, marine life, like those spade fish that were swimming around. And here you can see the diver using the uh, four inch dredge to suck up sediment. Uh, and we're just getting started. So you can tell the grids have been set up and we just barely dug a foot down into the sands. So we've got another two feet or so to go before we hit artifacts. Um, we also, uh, this year, allowed the students to run some research projects. So this was a lot of fun and one of the things that Allison did. And so our students, uh, we had a number of sites that are uh, uh, on the foreshore or tidal zones uh, throughout St. Augustine. So sites that are on land, but also underwater. And so this was a lot of fun. We went out with FPAN uh, to Shell Bluff. Uh, you've probably heard about this uh, site before. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun uh, for our students to help uh, participate in that kind of ongoing uh, study and understanding of how that site is being affected by erosion uh, factors. Uh, we went to the Lincolnville Landing site. Uh, so this is a site in Lincolnville, uh, right up there on the marsh. And uh, we found it actually, uh, 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 Mike Arbuthnot found it, uh, I think, uh, while walking his dog, or maybe uh, yeah, this was a long time ago, but uh, a pretty neat little site that probably served as a, a boat landing, like a, a little a local boat ramp, uh, maybe in the late 1800s or early 1900s. And uh, we found this site for a while. We've recorded timbers and the students uh, uh, visited there for the first time in quite a while uh, to see the uh, current condition of the site and had a lot of fun doing so. And uh, the students also looked at these groins. So these are structures that the Army Corps of Engineers had uh, built in uh, Salt Run. So you can see the location uh, uh, on this map uh, from an old uh, LAMP report. And uh, they were designed to help control erosion and to help uh, keep the shoreline stable. So that uh, goes to show that has been a long going concern here in St. Augustine since the 1890s at least. And some of you, if, if you are having a drink at Conk House or you're out on Salt Run on a, a kayak, uh, you'll see these groins. Uh, and then we looked at the old lighthouse site. Uh, so the original uh, site of the lighthouse uh, structure that dates to uh, possibly as early as the 1680s was used as a watchtower by the Spanish uh, by the 1730s. And uh, LAMP had before uh, some time ago, uh, but it's been a while since we've uh, pulled out tape measures and tried uh, and uh, re-looked at, remapped. Uh, what we have to see if things have changed over time. So the, the oyster shell coverage has changed. The coquina stones, not too surprisingly, are pretty stable. Uh, but so this was a fun project for the students as well. So at the close of field school, uh, we continued diving operations. Uh, we really uh, shut down uh, new excavations at Anniversary Wreck and Storm Wreck. If you remember, Storm Wreck uh, is a shipwreck that went down in 1782. It was a uh, a refugee ship at the end of the American Revolution carrying folks who were loyal to King George uh, away from the city of Charleston to other parts of the British Empire. This particular ship was coming in Augustine. 
uh, well, we're not digging to expose new artifacts, we're actually to repatriate artifacts. So we have brought up so many artifacts from our excavations. Uh, many of them are, say, pray then we'll see a giant clump of nails and we already have thousands of nails that we have uh, kind of excavated in the laboratory and conserved and are uh, taking time and precious resources uh, to preserve. So some of these artifacts we can actually put back and that's the safest place they can be. So uh, we got, uh, uh, we dealt with a lot of our artifact backlog this summer by returning a lot of these artifacts to where they had come from on the seafloor and uh, we would dig in the same spot uh, that we originally located the artifact to the same meter square unit and uh, 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 bury it again. Hopefully we'll be safe for another uh, uh, 200 plus years, maybe thousands. Um, uh, stable on the seafloor and we know where it is. Um, after our regular field season uh, was cut short by Hurricane Dorian, uh, we had some more work to do because of Hurricane Dorian. Uh, this is a known shipwreck, the Little Talbot Island wreck. Uh, this one has been around uh, known since the 1980s uh, and it gets exposed periodically by storms or hurricanes and it's actually moved uh, quite a, a good distance on the beach uh, from uh, over the years. And so this is recent and most recent exposure. And so we went and recorded and actually asked us with, well, Emily Jane uh, was with us. So it's always fun to uh, do a, a partnership uh, project. And, uh, and we had one of our uh, field school students joined us as well. So it's great to get uh, students involved. Uh, but we recorded the, this uh, piece of wreckage as it laid uh, uh, newly exposed, and this helps us understand how this site changes over time. And it's it's amazing this site has moved uh, miles uh, over the beach. Um, then we went to Brendan's neck of the woods uh, in October. We went up to Virginia uh, to the Nansaman River uh, in a little town, Suffolk, and you can see it uh, uh, here on. Uh, uh, in, in Virginia here. And we had heard uh, from the former state archeologists of Virginia of a ghost fleet, of a discovery of a lot of abandoned wooden vessels in this area. And they had asked if we could assist uh, with recording. And there was some uh, Virginia state grant money that helped and we partnered with Longwood University. And uh, these shipwrecks were really neat. This is an area where uh, wooden boats have been used commercially and then abandoned. Uh, some of them are small boats, might be pleasure boats, or, uh, you know, this looks like almost like a little wooden canoe, this little skiff here. And uh, some of them are quite spectacular, just big working vessels, uh, substantially uh, preserved. Uh, and so this was a really interesting project. Uh, this area here is a shot taken from the parking lot at the hotel we stayed at. So it was quite uh, easy logistically, at least to access the shipwrecks. We just kind of scrambled down a little bluff and there we were on the mud flats. Uh, and at low tide, these shipwrecks were exposed. Uh, this area of the town of Suffolk, Virginia, uh, had uh, uh, been a working waterfront uh, historically. So back in the late 1800s, uh, a, a man named Mc had had an oyster packing house. Uh, and it's quite interesting to see uh, the remains of these uh, wharfs, as well as a lot of the boats uh, that were used for this. Uh, this is one particular that we spent a lot of time on. We call it the Hobbs Wreck, uh, named after the local gentleman who uh, first discovered uh, these, uh, these, the, this ghost fleet. Uh, and uh, this, this was a fun uh, National Geographic cover that this isn't a real National Geographic cover, just so you know, but our friend uh, Eric Wilson, one of our longtime volunteers, Lighthouse uh, put this together for us when I sent him some pictures. But uh, we spent some time recording the shipwreck. Uh, with, uh, there's John Broadwater, very well known archaeologist, uh, underwater archaeologist, uh, who uh, had invited us down uh, to work on these wrecks. Uh, here's a picture that was taken after we left uh, at a very extreme low tide uh, with the entire uh, hull exposed. And we learned a lot uh, from this hole. This is a 3D model uh, that we made, and it's just an exquisite model. Uh, the photography just uh, turned out really well, even the portions that were submerged. Have laser scanning that uh, Longwood University uh, conducted. And so uh, we have a really good understanding of the hole. Uh, here's a drawing that Nick Budsberg did, and, uh, and this is just a, a, a great uh, rendering of the hole remains uh, as uh, we found them. And so this, ship, we've been able to identify the type 
uh, of this vessel. And this is uh, what was known as a bug eye. And a bug eye was a, a very well-known vessel type, uh, local vernacular watercraft, Chesapeake Bay. And uh, it was used for fishing, uh, fishing, which is what we think this one was used for. And here's a photograph of a bug eye. And uh, we could tell from the whole remains the placement of the masts uh, that were the two masts that were used to propel the ship and the centerboard that helped keep it stable while sailing. And uh, it was kind of rare for a bug eye uh, that it's, it was schooner rigged and they called that square headed bug eye. And so there's actually very few, there's only 37 of these uh, that were rigged this way. And, and we got this information from the uh, Mariners Museum in Newport News, Virginia. And uh, so there's a decent chance we might actually be able to identify this uh, this boat by name. So this is a, uh, was a really exciting uh, project, uh, fun to get out of Florida, uh, elsewhere uh, along the Atlantic uh, coastline, uh, another area that has maritime heritage, just like uh, St. Augustine in Florida. So we got back to Florida. Uh, you can you can tell we keep pretty busy. Uh, we had a contract that actually uh, uh, brought us in a little funding. Uh, the city of Fernandina Beach needed to expand their mooring field. And uh, just like St. Augustine, they have moorings out there where boats can come up and tie off. And to uh, secure things, they have to drill uh, down into the seafloor. And of course, no one wants to drill through a shipwreck site or uh, another type of site. Uh, and so uh, they hired us to do an archaeological survey. Uh, so we spent a few days doing a, a, a sonar and magnetometer work and then a few days and that was in uh, November and then in early March uh, once we uh, were just beginning to hear about coronavirus we were out in the field and uh, you can see uh, Austin is actually wearing a mask there but that's not because of the coronavirus that's because it was cold um, and uh, we, we staged our diving operations. Uh, and so that was an interesting project. We, uh, the, the targets we dived on were modern sailboat wrecks, not anything historic. Uh, we did find a, a prehistoric paleo channel, so an ancient uh, channel from an old river, and that's an area of high likelihood for prehistoric. And so we uh, informed uh, the state and uh, the city of Fernandina Beach that there should be no moorings placed in that zone because that uh, it could disrupt uh, prehistoric archeological remains. So that was a neat project. So by mid-March, everyone was aware of COVID-19 and what the coronavirus was and that we needed to social distance to try to fight this pandemic and flatten the curve. And so the lighthouse had closed to visitors by I think 16th of March. And we started working from home. Um, once we, you know, just, into our kind of uh, uh, social isolation, we heard that a shipwreck had observed on the beach at uh, the St. Right near the Mayport jetties, and uh, we decided that we would go and uh, check it out. So we stayed, uh, we stayed socially distanced from each other as much as we could. Uh, we drove separate uh, vehicles and uh, stayed apart from each other, uh, but we found not one but two shipwreck sites, uh, and here they are. Uh, you can see, uh, I'll use the mouse here, this is, is probably the bow of a vessel, uh, a wooden boat, and then here's a second wooden boat. And so these two shipwrecks are not social distancing each other within six feet of each other. And uh, it's kind of a neat little sight. Uh, the wood is very well preserved. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's surprising given the fact that uh, they're exposed uh, to, to the tides but uh, kind of a neat spot. There's an old wharf there that looks historic as well. And so we, we'll, we've got this one on our radar now and we'll try to uh, better understand uh, the history of this site. Uh, one uh, local uh, person told us that he thought uh, they might be wreckage related to Hurricane uh, uh, Doria back in uh, 1964. Uh, so how are we going to move forward? Uh, Archaeology, social distance, Many of you heard that we have received a grant. Uh, right now, uh, we are in a, uh, an uncertain financial time. You know, of course, the Lighthouse, like so many other uh, businesses, uh, both historical and uh, heritage-oriented businesses and tourism businesses uh, here uh, in St. Augustine, 
uh, we rely on visitation. We, we need visitors uh, to have funding. Uh, we are fortunate that we got this grant uh, and the timing is pretty good because if we didn't have this grant, we might not be able to be doing any archeology span at the lighthouse. Uh, we just don't know how things are gonna turn out. Uh, but we do have this grant, which is uh, federal money, uh, damage to historical sites from hurricane. Uh, we had uh, come up with a kind of research design that we would investigate eight sites. Uh, two of them are terrestrial sites uh, or foreshore sites. Uh, so uh, the Fort Mose, which we all know of, uh, has some of Fort Mose that have suffered erosion since it was originally investigated by Kathy Deegan. So we're going to see uh, if we can tell what remains uh, on the uh, creek bed uh, that may have eroded in. And we're going to see if we can find uh, the location of the other occupation of Fort Mose, which is believed to be uh, submerged now. The Tullamato Bar Anchorage site is our other foreshore site that we will be reinvestigating. Uh, this is one that LAMP has known about for quite some time. Uh, it's up uh, along the Tolomato River and it features uh, historic wharf remains dating to uh, Governor Grant's plantation there during the British period and, and then subsequent Menorcan farmsteading afterwards. Uh, and, in, uh, and it certainly has suffered erosion uh, issues, that, so that's something we have monitored in the past, uh, but we'll have some renewed interest in that. And then we'll be looking at a series of ship uh, the industry, uh, 1764 anniversary wreck, storm wreck, uh, steamship and ballast pile, uh, maybe 1860s, 1890s, somewhere in there, uh, Booner, also late 1800s, and the comp, which is one that was discovered uh, quite some time ago, uh, but uh, we haven't looked at it in quite a while. In fact, we're, we're not very familiar with that one. So that'll be interesting to uh, see if we can relocate and uh, uh, better understand that uh, shipwreck site. Uh, so this grant gives us a, a framework for in sites, uh, better understanding the uh, in increasingly adverse effects of climate change and hurricane damage on our submerged cultural resources. And uh, it also, uh, fortunately for the lighthouse, uh, is helping us keep archaeology alive because it's a source of funding that we sorely need right now with the uh, un uncertain times we have. Uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, we will have to, we are looking at now uh, how we can uh, safely dive uh, during this pandemic, how we can social distance on a, a boat. Uh, of course, we are effectively social distanced when we're underwater, but we'll have to disinfect our scuba gear and things like that. So we're working to be safe and still carry on archaeology. Uh, this picture you see here is from the 1918 flu epidemic, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, that was so uh, horrible all around the world. And, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of why we like archaeology, why we like history, because we understand, uh, if we understand, as they say, we can better understand our present and better uh, look forward to the future. And there's a lot we can learn about from the history of these things as we are now through it. Um, so I want to and remind all of you to hashtag love your lighthouse. Uh, the lighthouse again is facing economic uncertainty. So if folks are able to help out uh, through donations, uh, through getting online, you can you can buy tickets at a re uh, so that once we reopen, you uh, get a great rate on your tickets. Uh, anything folks can do to help, uh, do our work uh, preserving history, archaeology would be great. Uh, and uh, we always appreciate our SAAA uh, family and the support uh, that our local archaeology community gives us. Uh, so with all of that, that's what LAMP has been up to this past year, uh, before and now during uh, coronavirus. I hope you all stay safe, stay home, stay socially distanced, and stay informed and keep on supporting St. Augustine Archaeology. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for uh, allowing me the uh, opportunity to continue to uh, communicate with our favorite archaeology community. Thanks again, SAAA.